But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It should come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. You just got dreaming, Luke. <laughs> and, on, and on my man servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. We go on to, to um, verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, that every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. <coughs> now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold the possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This morning I want to just remind us again of that the tremendous story, the birth of the church. The birth of the church. As we begin a new year, it's good to just go back to first principles. Now, if you study theology, the study of God, that is, then, then you know that there are various laws, even in theology, like in science, and there's a law of first reference. The law of first reference says this, if you want to study something in its purest form, <coughs> then you need to get back the first mention of that subject. And there you find it in its purest form. For example, if you want to study the doctrine of man, then you don't start in, in, with politicians in 2023. You don't even start in Genesis 3. You start in Genesis chapter 1. For example, there it says, Genesis 1, 26, and God said, <coughs> let's make man in our image, according to our likeness. And then it says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. There it is. Man is unique. He's created in the image of God. He's a moral being. He's, he's got creative abilities. He's got a conscience. He's different to anything else of creation. He's created in the image of God. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Man is a spirit, a soul, and a body. Three parts, but one. And so we begin to get something of the unique nature of man by going right back to the first reference. Male and female, he created them. That's so clear. You get back to Genesis 1. You get the clarity. Then in Genesis 2, it talks about the first wedding, the first marriage that God instituted between a man and a woman. These two should become one flesh. And so we have the, if you want it in its purest form, go back to the beginning. If you start to study up the Genesis 3, it gets distorted. And as the years go by, as the centuries go by, it gets more and more distorted. So to find the truth, to find the reality, go back to the beginning. So today we're going to look at church. And so we need to go back to the first reference. What is church or what should church really look like? It may have been distorted. So you need to get back to the very first reference. 
I went out on the street and asked people, what is church? They said, oh, it's that building. You know, there's one down the road in, in um, there's a big one down the road in, in Cardiff Road in Abraham and it's up there in Aberdeer. And, yeah, churches, it's a building. Somebody else said, oh, churches, that, that place where you've got somebody dressed in robes with a collar and, and they lead the services. Somebody else said, oh, no, it's uh, air services, churches services, morning services, and oh, they're going to have another evening services, and so on. But if those are your answers, they're not what church is. But we can get used to thinking that way. So we need to go back to the first reference, find out what is church meant to look like, and see if we can capture something and say, God revives something of the first Reference to church in us and among us. So we're going to look at it in three sections. Pre-birth. Talking about the birth of the church. We look at pre-birth. We look at birth. And we look at post-birth. So pre-birth. What a day the day of Pentecost was. I love reading about the day of Pentecost. 120 people praising, praying, expectant. Wow. Wow. If you're looking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, those are the conditions. Praising, praying, expectant, hungry, thirsty. And the Holy Spirit came. As a rushing sound of a mighty wind. Tongues of fire come upon them. And they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak with languages they've never learned supernaturally by the Spirit. Wow, what a day. But they could have stayed in that upper room and enjoyed that. But God says, no, you don't. He thrust them out onto the streets. And on the streets, thousands and thousands had gathered. You say, how did the thousands gather? Well, the answer is there in, in, the, in the scriptures. It says, they heard the sound of the Lord in verse 6. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. Oh, I see something there that can often be missed. The sound of the Lord. Yes, there's a sound in that upper room, but there's also sound right throughout the city. It's the sound of the Lord. You have time to study it this morning. You find it in Genesis. You find it when David is about to go to battle on one occasion. The sound of the Lord, a unique sound. The so vocal, audible sense of God moving. When God does that, it speaks deep into the heart and soul of man. Even, the, even an atheist We'll have to respond to this because God put eternity in the heart of every man and woman. And the people were drawn by the sound of the Lord. Maybe church bells are some kind of poor imitation of this in today's times. But oh, the sound of the Lord is drawing people. So what is this? What is this? Something. I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to go. It's the sound of the Lord. And I pray, oh God, let your sound be heard. We need to pray the sound of the Lord be heard. That draws people, that draws people to God. Something from deep within them just calls out and they have to go, they have to go to find out. If we had time, we could look at things like the Hebridean revival where people just came, just flocked. They were drawn by the sound of the Lord. So the crowds gather. And then there's this once upon a time fear-filled man, Peter, you study Peter before the cross, he, he couldn't even witness to a maid. But now he's a fire-filled messenger. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he preaches to the crowds. Some people say, well, it was quite a short message, actually. Shorter than what yours is going to be. <laughs> uh, I would dispute that. Verse 40 says that the person who was taking notes gave up. It says, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. Said, oh, I can't be bothered taking any more notes. So, but no, Peter preaches. What I notice about his sermon, it's this. It's Bible-based. If we read it all, you'd find this. It's Bible-based. It's Jesus-centered. It's cross-focused. It's Holy Spirit-anointed. Let me repeat those. It's Bible-based. It's Jesus-centered. It's cross-focused. It's Holy Spirit anointed. And I say, God, revive that kind of preaching again. Wow, not this sort of people-friendly messages. Not these kind of politically correct messages. But oh, some real good Holy Ghost preaching. Hallelujah. You might say, yes, great. Preach it to the preachers. 
Well, you are the preachers. We are the preachers. You see, it's not about somebody standing up here. It's about us in our day-to-day lives. We need to share messages. We share our own story. We need to mix that story with something that's Bible-based, Jesus-centered, cross-focused, Holy Spirit-anointed. Hallelujah. As we share the greatest message of all time. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he went to Corinth, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech, but I came in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, preaching to you Jesus and Him crucified. Hallelujah. Wow, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. So that's a bit about free birth. Then we get to the birth bit. This is exciting. In, in, uh, I just read it again for you. In verse 38, they said, Men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there are four elements. Four elements repentance, faith, they're essential to birth. You can't get to heaven without those. And then the manifestation of birth. Like when a baby's born, it starts to cry. There's a manifestation of birth. The manifestation of birth, you're baptized in water and then baptized in the Holy Spirit. Wow. David Paulson, a great Bible teacher, he's still alive, but particularly he was the last end of the last century. He, he talks about normal Christian birth, the four elements of normal Christian birth in a book called Normal Christian Birth. So let's look at them. Repentance. People don't like talking about that. They like an easy kind of Christianity. Oh, I don't want repentance. So negative. You get to pass vision of somebody with a big placard, repent, your end is nigh or something. Whatever you find the majority of times when repentance is mentioned in the Bible, it's always positive. It's a very positive word. Like John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. Look, the rule of God is within your grasp. Knowing God, experiencing God is close to you. So turn from the way you're going. Turn from your sinful ways and turn to God. Wow, it's positive. You don't mind turning from something if you're going to get something even better. And that's what repentance is saying. Wow. Jesus says the same, repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. And then here in this passage, repent and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can know the liberating, powerful rule of God in your life. The blessing of God in your life. It's a gift from God. Wow, it's a good reason to repent. Say, God, I really want to turn from where I'm going. I've messed up, I've sinned, I've failed. I want to turn to you and receive all that you've got for me. Praise God. Repent is so important. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And then faith. You say, well, it doesn't quite mention faith here. Well, I would disagree. It's not directly mentioned, but they had to believe. They had to accept. They had to act on the message. That's faith. In fact, verse 31 says, well, this, verse 41 would be even better still. Verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Those who gladly received his word. There's faith. Not some religious faith, but living, vibrant faith. Real faith. It comes by the word. It comes by the name. It comes by the Holy Spirit. Wow. What kind of faith are they act on that? That's be faith. You repent when you put your trust and your faith. You throw yourself upon God and believe God. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. That God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Romans 10 9. Wow. Faith. Faith is so essential. And then, with that water baptism, repent, believe, be baptized. Be baptized. 
You know, the early church wasted no time about this. They did the same day. Same day. We're a bit cold in the river today, but hey, anyone up for it? <laughs> same day. Same day. 3,000. 3,000 people declared they identified with the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. 3,000 people said an old life has ended, a new life has begun. 3,000 people began a life of obedience to the Lordship of Jesus. Wow, that's baptism. Let me tell you, you think it was just a nice thing to do. For them, it cost. It cost. For many of them, and we know from studying the scripture, for the widows there who gave their lives to Jesus that day, they were cut off from their families. There was no social security, no widow's pensions in those days. The families had to support. And when they turned and gave their lives to Jesus, the family said, okay, that's what you want. We're cutting you off. But thank God for the loving community called church. You read Acts chapter 6. Who cares for the widows? Who looks after the widows? Church. When they're cut off, who steps in? The church. Who shares everything they have to support them? The church. Wow, I just love that thought of how the church responds and acts. Let me tell you, it happens even in these days too. I may have shared this before. and I know as a church you support Tomiki Kasaki and Olive in Japan. And uh, you know their story, Tom got saved and uh, he got mightily filled with the Holy Spirit in our church in Bristol and I was pastoring in Bristol. And um, that was great. And uh, he didn't let his parents know too much because they'd been telling him, you don't go to the same church two weeks in a row. You've got to move around. We don't want you to settle in one place. But now he was, ah, I, I must settle here. But then he just knew he had to be baptized in water. When he was baptized in water, he knew that would cost. It did. His family cut him off. He was disowned as a son. He was cut off. And from that moment on, we as a church took up the responsibility of caring for him, of supporting him. He went on to go to Bible college in the Philippines and we support him right through that. He was never without, as we support him. The family, we're very involved with that too. The church steps in. Wow. That's what happened here. Wow, isn't it a great story? And then they says, Peter said, and, and receive the Holy Spirit. Wow, the early church wasted no time about getting Christians. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only did they get baptized the same day, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, we need Holy Spirit. We can't live without Him. We can't manage without Him. You know, Jesus said to His disciples, now wait at Jerusalem until you're endued, until you're clothed with power from on high. And then Peter says this on the day of Pentecost, and you should receive the Holy Spirit for His promises to you, to your children, to those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And then we get to Acts chapter 8 and the gospel message being preached in Samaria. And when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God and the people were saved and baptized, they sent Peter and John down to them. They might pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. Saul of Tarsus, when he's converted on the Damascus Road, Ananias said, go and pray for him to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, Peter's preaching to the Gentiles, and they, trust, they put their trust in his word, and as, they, as he's preaching, the Holy Spirit comes upon those Gentiles. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 19, the Apostle Paul says to some Christians at, at, at Ephesus, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Do you get it? The constant record of the of, of the Acts of Apostles is saying the importance of being filled, of being filled and refilled and constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, we need to get back to some first principles here. So we've got pre-birth, we've got birth, 
Now we're going to go into post birth. You know, it's great when a baby's born, but how many of you know there's a lot of hard work? A lot of hard work. That's why it's great being grandparents. How many know how good it is to be grandparents? You go in, you wind them up, and you hand them back. <laughs> it's terrific. <laughs> you got the kids. Oh, picking new babies. You know, <laughs> every Thursday during term time, we, we look after our youngest grandchild, our granddaughter Lillian. <laughs> and uh, for the day, oh, it's so good. At five o'clock, say, so there you are. <laughs> Oh, how can how can some of you need one year old? Where are you at? <laughs> Post birth, it's where it all begins, and that's where the church, I feel, has got to go back to these first principles. You know, we get so excited. Oh, yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand. People getting saved. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And yes, it is wonderful. There's rejoicing in heaven, and there's a party in heaven, and so on. But actually, Jesus didn't say go make get people to make decisions. In Matthew 28, in Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples. We have to recognize the importance of disciple-making, of training people in the will and the ways of the Lord. That is vital. It's so vital. It's so essential. If we're going to see church get back to how it should be. And so that's what happens here. We find it in verse 42. Verse 41, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. They continued steadfastly. If you want the original words, maybe your Bible says something different, but the actual original words were uh, this. They addicted themselves. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. That's the actual original Greek word. It means they addicted themselves. Well, in my time as a doctor and working with Teen Challenge and so on, over the years, I had you know, dealt with a number of drug addicts, and particularly thinking of heroin addicts, or even alcoholics with heroin addicts. You know, they, they, they just live for the next fix. But then they wanted it more frequently and they wanted more of it. That's what it means to be addicted. Wow, are we like that with Jesus? Are we like that about the things of God? Are you a Christian addict? You know, back in the 60s and 70s, they used to use that phrase, turned on to Jesus. It's a bit of a druggy kind of connotation. Hey, we need to get back to being addicted to Jesus. We really do. So what were they addicted to exactly? The Apostles' Doctrine. What's the Apostles' Doctrine? Sounds deep. Sounds deep. There's two factors. One, the person of Jesus. And two, the teachings of Jesus. Remember on the road to Emmaus, there were those two guys, Jesus risen from the dead, but they didn't know that. And they were down in the mouth and they were you know, experiencing the blues and they were thinking, oh no, this shouldn't have happened. And Jesus comes alongside and says, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible. And he says, what's terrible? And they say to him, and then, beginning from Moses and the prophets, beginning from the law and the prophets, Jesus does a Bible study showing from the Old Testament how the Messiah would come, would suffer, would die, and rise again. It showed that the Messiah is the Son of the living God. The person of Jesus. And that's what the apostles would have taught the people. They would have done a Bible study. Because they wouldn't have had the New Testament. They'd do a Bible study through the Old Testament. Showing that, that all those things, shadows and types and so on. How they all reveal Jesus. So people knew that they knew, yes, this is Jesus. The promised Messiah. The Son of God. Who need to die, who need to suffer, who need to, who was buried and arose again. Who sent the Holy Spirit and one day is coming again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what they taught. That's what they taught. The person of Jesus. And then the teachings of Jesus. In the commission, Jesus teach them to obey 
all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You read Matthew 28. So what would those teachings be? We need to know because we need to get into them and study them. Well, predominantly they would be Matthew 5, 6, and 7. What we call the Sermon on the Mount. That's what they would have taught. That's what Jesus taught. If you read your gospel, you'll find that Jesus constantly refers back to elements of the Sermon on the Mount. You get the full thing in, full package in Matthew, but then in Luke and Mark, you get bits and pieces of it. Jesus is constantly teaching his people. So what kind of things would they teach the, the church, these new Christians? Well, things like prayer, fasting, giving. Jesus taught those things. Forgiveness. That was big in the Sermon on the Man. Forgiveness. Loving, your, loving God. Loving your neighbor. Loving your enemies. Ooh, that's a toughie. Jesus taught it. Being salt. Being light. Seeking first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. Trusting that God will provide. Wow, those are some of the elements. It's just a very brief overview. But those are some of the elements when you teach people the will and the ways of the Lord to the person of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. That's the apostles' doctrine. That's the apostles' doctrine. But then it says they addicted themselves to that. They addicted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship. What's Fellowship. Something a cup of tea after service. Fellowship, is it two guys in a boat? Somebody said that, you know, jokingly, oh, some guys in a boat, fellowship. A bit cheesy. But actually, if that boat is in a storm, and those guys are having to row together, fight for each other, encourage each other, Look out for each other. The guy's a wave coming. Be careful there, you know. And, and they work. And they're really rowing hard. They're fighting for their lives. They're fighting for each other's lives. Oh, then I begin to think, yes. No, that, that's, that's speaking of fellowship. Because fellowship is about doing life together, supporting one another, caring for one another, praying for one another, getting behind one another, encouraging one another, spurring each other on. Hallelujah. That's fellowship. That's real fellowship. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. But in fact, as you know that the coming of the Lord is soon, do it even more so. Hebrews 10, 25. We need to be in fellowship. Not just sitting spread out in a meeting, but actually feeling for each other, praying for each other, caring for each other. That's fellowship. And then it says, they addicted themselves to that. And breaking of bread. Breaking of bread. Now most commentators say that it's actually referring to communion, what we've done this morning. But what was going on here was perhaps even something, this was precious this morning, but it was even more precious. Because what it would be when these people met together, remember they're sharing all things, they're eating together in each other's homes and they're really encouraging one another. What they would do at the end of a meal Take some bread and take some wine and say, let's remember Jesus. Wow, what it tells me, Jesus was at the center of everything. It says daily. This is not just once a week or in some churches once a month. This is daily. They're remembering and saying, look, it's about Jesus. He is center to everything. We don't want to forget that. We want him to be part of everything. Wow. That's the sense of breaking of bread here. And then prayer. They gave themselves to prayer. They addicted themselves to prayer. The church was birthed in prayer. I mentioned at the beginning, they were 120 were praying and praising and expectant. It continues in prayer. We haven't time to go through all the references this morning, but you read Acts 4. Peter and John have been threatened. They get back and the people are waiting, praying and they get in amongst the prayer meeting and there was one voice. They raise a voice to God. They cry out together, Lord, you are God. And have then grant yourselves boldness to preach your word. And before they know it, the Holy Spirit comes. The place is shaken by the power of God. Wouldn't you like a prayer meeting like that? 
Oh, no, it's not scary, really. Ah, oh, Acts chapter 12. Peter's been arrested. It looks like he's going to be executed because James has already been executed. And the church, what the church is, the church meets to pray. It's praying through the night. It's an all night and they're praying and they're pleading together. And God miraculously releases Peter from prison. Read Acts 12. In fact, he couldn't get into the prayer meeting. <laughs> I always think it's a funny story because this girl answers the door. And, oh, it's Peter. Everyone, Peter's at the door. No, don't be silly. You teenagers are all the same. Sit down, carry on praying. No, it really is. And Peter said, no, come on, someone. Hey, read it for yourself. But the church was praying. The church was praying. Wow, how we need to get back to these elements. How we need to get back to these elements. But that's not all. In that atmosphere, we read certain other things that are going on. There's a real sense of the awe of God and fear came upon every soul. They weren't afraid of God, but they were it's a reverential awe of God, of, of worship of God. God, you're amazing. <coughs> they didn't want to do anything that would hurt God in any way. They just wanted to live for Him. The awe of God. Wow, so lacking today. The awe of God. And then generosity. Wow. It wasn't so grudgingly coming, okay, if I got to give a tenth, I'll give a tenth. No, they said, Lord, everything's yours. It's not mine, it's yours. That was their attitude. They were selling up property, they were doing all kinds of stuff to support the church, the infant church. Wow. We might catch something of that generosity. That generosity. That love. That love for each other displayed in generosity. And then there was praise. They just abandoned themselves to praise. And they just praise God. Wow. So the people everywhere heard them praising. They were just so loving Jesus, so full of the joy of the Lord. And in that atmosphere, of the awe of God, of the praise of God, of generosity and love, do you know what happened? Miracles. That's what it says. It says that miracles occurred. Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done for the apostles. Not only that, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Wow. The birth of the church. Don't you sense, God, I want to get back there. Ah, oh, I want to be part of something like that. And we say, Lord, revive us again. Restore us again. Oh, Lord, that we might become those, we might pray for the sound of the Lord we heard in the land again. That we might share the message of Jesus. Jesus-centered, cross-focused. Bible-based, Holy Spirit anointed. Oh, that we might bring people to a place of repentance and faith and get them baptized in water, filled with the Holy Spirit. And we might disciple them, that they might be so in love with Jesus they'd be addicted to become Jesus addicts, so to speak. And they'll be addicted to the Apostles' doctrine, teaching on the person of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. They'll be addicted to to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. But there might be such an atmosphere that the Holy Spirit will move and the miracles will occur and the lost will be saved. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father God, these are familiar things in many ways to us. But we realize, Lord, we can just drift and drift and drift. We want to get back to first things. We want to get back to first principles, Lord. Lord, we want something of that love, that addiction to get hold of us. <laughs> that we just want to be in your presence with your people. We want to be sharing Jesus. We want to be 
talking to everyone we can. We want the sound of the Lord to be heard. The people we drawn and attracted. The people who just can't stop themselves but coming on talking to us as individuals and coming to our churches too. Oh God, I pray, revive us again. Restore us again. Help us get back to first principles that, oh God, your name might be glorified. Your name might be exalted. The world might see that our Jesus, he's alive and he's moving by his spirit in these days. Lord, bless your people here. Encourage everyone. Oh God, let the miraculous begin to break out and begin to touch people and heal people. Let people find Jesus every day. Oh God, there is who need comfort, and comfort them. Those who need support, support them, Lord, that we might just be a loving community of people. Everyone feels loved and welcomed. Just thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.